Hi, hi, Alison McQuillan, Geotechnical Engineer here. This video recording is off the paper Neil Barr and I presented at Euroc in 2024 in Alicante. We decided to share the video presentation to mark 500 reads of the paper on ResearchGate. Thanks for the interest today. Per the title, this, this presentation is about block failures in rock slopes and the methods we have available to predict both the likelihood and consequence of rock slope failure. First, I want to pose a question about identifying and quantifying risk from a non-geotechnical context before I focus on rock mechanics. The scenario is there's a swimmer or a surfer in the ocean and a great white shark is also swimming in the ocean. What is the risk? Well, it depends on the proximity and interaction of the swimmer to the shark. If they are swimming in the same ocean and it's around dinner time, then the risk of a shark attack could be considered high. However, if they are swimming in different oceans, that is relative to my home country, the shark is cruising around in the cooler waters of South Australia and the surfer is ripping it up on the Gold Coast, then the risk of a shark attack could be considered relatively low, even non-existent. Agree? In this scenario, for a higher risk, there must be interaction between the two variables, that is the swimmer and the shark. If the two variables cannot interact with each other, then the risk of the shark attack in this scenario disappears. What does this have to do with rock mechanics? When completing slope stability analysis, in particular kinematic analysis using stereo nets to identify the potential for structurally driven failure, we need to ensure the structures we are analysing can interact or intersect with each other to form valid blocks. If the interaction between structures is not considered, then the risk may be incorrectly quantified. Looking at the state of the art, in a kinematic analysis, all map defects are often imported into the one grid file or stereo net, resulting in the assumption and analysis that all defects will intersect with each other. In reality, this is not the case, as defects mapped in subsections of the pit slope will never interact or intersect with defects mapped in another section of the pit slope. Take this example of a wedge analysis. Are all of these highlighted intersections in the wedge sliding zone realistic? Or rephrasing, do all the map structures actually intersect to form valid blocks? The answer is we don't know unless we analyze and filter the defect data by mapping domain and persistence. However, we must also be wary about underestimating the persistence of defects as shown in these next slides. This is the raw field mapping data that was entered into the previous stereo net analysis. Zooming in on two different sections of the pit, you can see that some of the map defects are likely underestimated in persistence. I'm assuming that some of these individually mapped joints actually belong to the same defect, such as this one, this one, and this one. And over here, this one, this one, and this one. Agree? In the Sterina analysis, this is not obvious to us, but viewing in 3D, we can more readily identify limitations with our data set and complete necessary sensitivity analysis to overcome and account for these limitations. Using RockSlope 3, a 3D LE modeling code, I can readily analyze the potential for structure failure of defects that are actually mapped to intersect per the measured length scenario on the left. I can also complete sensitivity analysis by doubling and doubling again the map persistence in the center and left scenarios to determine the change in size and location of potential block falls to account for the underestimation of persistence in this data set. By completing this modeling, I've added more value and insight than the previous stereo analysis alone. Agree? Analyzing in true 3D, we can also identify key blocks, where key blocks are defined as blocks that control the stability of a rock slope. That is, if the key block moves, a larger scale failure can be triggered. In this section of slope, using successive iteration function, we can identify this key block. Should this block fail by sliding out of the face, this larger block can now kinematically slide out of the face. This highlights to us that if we want to minimize the potential for block failure, we need at least to stabilize this key block 
to prevent larger failure from potentially occurring. For every block that is computed, we are also returned with the required support pressure and slope face area, so we can readily calculate the minimum support force required to increase the key block's factor of safety to the design acceptance criteria, which in this model was one. Each block's volume is also calculated, which can be useful information for estimating the consequence of failure by referencing empirical charts which predict runout distance using volume. So by moving to 3D limit equilibrium analysis, we can now calculate both the quantitative likelihood of failure in terms of a factor of safety or probability of failure and estimate consequence of failure, as well as identify key blocks for stability analysis and risk management. Moving to a second case study discussed in the paper, face mapping was completed using aerial photogrammetry and shape metrics software to determine the intensity of defects and likely stability of a subsequent pit wall cutback. Again, using rock slope three, structural mapping was analyzed to determine valid and key blocks based on the true spatial location of measured defects. The analysis indicated that over 99% of the blocks were calculated to have a factor of safety greater than one with over 19,500 valid blocks computed. The results of this analysis were used to predict the stability of the subsequent cutback, assuming a similar fracture network would be realized. Similar to case one, the volumes calculated from the valid blocks were used to estimate runout distance to make an evaluation of bench width requirements and risk to operations. To close, the key points of this paper and presentation include, when analysing for block failure, ensure structures being analysed can actually interact with each other to form valid blocks. Complete sensitivity analysis to account for data limitations or uncertainty. Using the same information we currently have available to complete our stereonet analyses, we can also complete a 3D limit equilibrium analysis. 3D limit equilibrium analysis can assist to quantify factor of safety or probability of failure, which is not readily calculated in stereonet analysis. Identify key blocks in true 3D space to determine potential domino effects or unraveling effects. Identify the potential for slope unraveling should key blocks fail. Estimate found material volume for risk analysis and always assess options. That is, look at the scenario with multiple analysis methods to ensure a robust geotechnical review. Thanks for your time to read our paper and watch this recording. If you're interested in any further video discussions of our papers, like and comment below and we'll see what we can mash together. Cheers.